Welcome to Peopling the Past. My name is Caroline Arbuckle McLeod, and I'm an archaeologist currently working as a researcher at the University of British Columbia. So, for our first question, what topic are you talking about today? Today, I'm going to be talking about the people who built objects in ancient Egypt. Right now, my work focuses in particular on those individuals who constructed wooden coffins. To understand some of the complicated roles that these people may have held in their society, I want to first explain a little bit about the coffins themselves. In ancient Egypt, a coffin wasn't just a container that held the body of the deceased. They were also magic vessels that protected the deceased spirit and helped it on the journey to the afterlife. Because of this, coffins were seen as a really important part of the burial, and they were used throughout the entirety of Egyptian history and in all areas of Egypt to bury the elite. Over the long history of ancient Egypt, thousands of years, the different religious meanings of the coffins changed, along with their shape and decoration. As the coffins changed, the craftspeople and artists involved in making these objects also had to change their techniques, learn new skills, or work with other specialists. By the end of the New Kingdom, around 1100 BCE, a coffin had to be carefully carved into a human or anthropoid shape, it had to be painted with colorful images of the gods and protective symbols, and spells from what is commonly referred to today as the Book of the Dead were also written over it. It might also be inlaid with glass or precious stones or covered over with gold or silver. Then rituals were performed on the coffin to activate these spells before it was finally placed in a tomb. So what I'm really interested in is understanding the people involved at each step of construction. I want to know who they were, if and how different specialists worked together, and how they had to adjust their approach when coffin styles changed once more. Of course, getting to this information means investigating a lot of different evidence. This brings us then to the next question. What sources or data do you look at? There are three main types of evidence that I use to study coffins and their construction. The material evidence, which involves a close investigation of objects. Pictorial evidence, which for me largely involves the examination of scenes from tombs and the textual evidence. So for the material evidence, I start by looking at the coffins themselves and take note of the different construction choices and decorative patterns used over time. I look carefully at details such as the different techniques that carpenters used to join the parts of the coffin together in addition to the different pigments used for decoration and any added materials. I also analyze the cellular structure of the wood, which can help me understand what species of wood is used in the construction. This is important as it can tell me if the wood was local or imported. At different times in Egyptian history, Egypt was cut off from imported woods like Lebanese cedar, which was the favorite for coffin construction. So at these times, artists again had to change their techniques to work with local timber. Then, to help me better understand the construction and the choices made by craftspeople and artists, I study the tools that they used. I can then compare these to marks left on the objects, which are called tool marks. Sometimes the different strokes and patterns in the tool marks can help me understand if the artist was an expert or an apprentice, and if they had full access to the full suite of tools available to them. To get a better idea of what was involved in creating these objects, I've also worked with carpenters and artists in Cairo and Los Angeles and have constructed a number of wooden objects myself. This has helped me to better understand the tool marks that I find on ancient objects and has certainly made me appreciate the skill of both ancient and modern woodworkers. And now on to the pictorial evidence. Luckily for us, the ancient Egyptians also loved to depict workshops on their tomb walls. They believed that by illustrating events and objects in their tombs, they could ensure that the tomb owner would have access to these elements in the afterlife. There are therefore some very detailed illustrations of ancient workshops that also help to reveal aspects of production. Then there is the written evidence. <clears throat> this can take the form of transaction records and temple donation lists 
which can tell me what people were working on, how much they charged for different tasks, and the relative values of different materials. But what I really like to study are biographies. And again, we as Egyptologists are so lucky that the ancient Egyptian people wanted to record aspects of their lives in their tombs. A number of biographies from tombs and objects like this one called stele have been found that belong to craftspeople and artists. This one is my favorite, the stele of Irti Sen from the Middle Kingdom around 2000 BCE. Irti Sen describes himself as an overseer of craftsmen, a scribe and a sculptor who knows the hidden knowledge of hieroglyphs and the conduct of festive rituals. Finally, there are also times when texts, images, and objects all come together. The spells written on coffins, either called coffin texts or the Book of the Dead spells, depending on the period, tell us about the changing religious beliefs associated with these objects. And sometimes they help us question our assumptions about the different roles that people held in society. Take a look at this side of a coffin of Jehutinacht, also from around 2000 BCE. The red box is highlighting an area of the coffin that would not be visible once it was put together with the other coffin sides. Let's take a closer look at it. Hopefully you can see here that there are spells scratched into the joint on the left and onto the tenon, a piece of wood used to join the sides together, on the right. These spells had to be added during the construction process. Does this mean that carpenters worked closely with priests and scribes during each stage of construction? Or were these carpenters like Irtisen, multi-talented and trained in a number of different skills? Asking these questions brings us to our final section. How can this topic or material tell us about real people in the past? All of this evidence comes together to provide us with some really amazing insight into the lives of craftspeople and artists. We can track how these individuals had to adapt long-standing traditions and techniques to changes in religious beliefs and to changes in access to materials due to shifts in trade networks or warfare between different regions. Tool marks help us identify the work of experienced versus beginner artists, which can help us study the training process and which patrons had access to different workshops. Perhaps most importantly, however, all this evidence, the different added materials and religious knowledge necessary to complete these objects, makes us question our ability to easily label people in the past, to place them into discrete categories or ranks in society. Irti Sen, for instance, describes himself as an overseer of workers, a sculptor, a scribe, and somebody who knows sacred rituals. He is therefore a multi-talented, educated artist who in other contexts might be considered a priest. Secret spells written in coffin joints, which would be hidden after construction, again, make us question our assumptions. It helps to remind us that people who created objects, who are usually labeled as craftspeople, might belong to high positions in society. It reminds us that people can fill multiple roles in the community, and that people in the past, just like people today, are complicated. But it is these complications that make studying the past interesting. And with each discovery, we get a little closer to piecing together the lives of individuals who lived so long ago. Thank you so much for watching, and don't forget to look through some of the other videos and podcasts from Peopling the Past.